the magician, or to put it into modern language, perhaps the scientist, could we say? Uh, how much play do we have in modern empiricism? What do we see on our tables in front of us? We've got in the Marseille deck uh, the magician looking perhaps idly, perhaps distractedly to his right, right being for Hodorowski, the uh, potential of action or the side of action, left being passivity. Um, and the uh, we have so much going on already uh, on the table and you can see already on mine that we consider possibly his table as a modern laboratory, labor, the idea of work, the love of work, um, the amour, the in amateur, the love within being an amateur. He stands for number one. That's the one. That's the first sentence here in Hodorowsky's um, The Way of the Tarot. Here we go. Um, and that's a slight pun, possibly, that he stands out for number one. The numbers were really important or are really important for Alejandro Hodorowsky. Uh, he really believed in a strong numerological basis of the Marseille deck. For Hodorowsky, the number one is the, the symbol of potential. Number two is germination, that's piercing through. But potential is even before that. It's sort of a potentially premature action. So in many ways, the magician is the playful scientist uh, child of the deck, upon which the rest of the tarot leans. And he's still standing there in all of his beautiful naivety. I believe this this, this card, this ar major arcana, has a lot to do with, uh, with drugs, with intoxication, with impulsivity, or impulse. A lot to do with instruments, toys, a lot to do with play and science. And can teach us a lot about not dividing up those worlds, that there's plenty of art in science and plenty of science in art predictably. So it's called Le Batteleur, Le Batteleur in the, in the original French. Uh, that simply means uh, magician. It's also a kind of eagle. And it's often associated with the French court. So you've got the jester, the, the, um, the fool. Um, so very much in that, in that realm of, well, what, what is a magician to medieval society, Renaissance society, the society that uh, gave birth to the tarot? What, what, what was the function of a magician? Um, there is no such direct, obvious sort of comparison to a magician today. Um, but magicians must have paid their way through their lives. They were members of society and there's a reason they existed. There's plenty of magic in um, ancient China, in the um, alchemical Taoist uh, practices. Um, and I'm sure in, in many other societies, there was a place in society for magicians. What was it? Uh, was it? Was 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 magic and alchemy, in fact, a kind of proto-science? Was this playing through experience or empiricism a way of us now understanding positivism, so uh, truth, rationality, and falseness or, or myth? Um, and uh, were they part? Were the people creating spells? Uh, were the people trying to heal? Were they people in, involved in dark or? Uh, white magic, magic to serve the self or serve others. Were they creating potions? Were they male uh, witches? You could say witches were it's one term for female healers. I'll start with the chapter then. Um, from Hodorowsky's The Way of the Tarot. Le Bataleur, the magician, beginning and choosing. Choosing is the subtitle of this chapter. The magician bears the number one. This figure contains the whole in potential. The whole in potential. I think of like a seed before it germinates. It is like the original point from which a universe emerges. It is like the original point from which a universe emerges. That seems to be already to cascade towards that, that origin of the, of the earth the immensely condensed space of the earth, which no one really understands. So are we talking about number one being a, a, 
an eternally mis- eternal mystery. Um, we can't ever know the origin. For the magician, all is possible. He has a series of elements on the table in front of him that he can use as he pleases, and a pouch that is easily imagined to be inexhaustible, like a horn of plenty, a cornucopia, a horn of plenty. From his table, this figure acts towards the cosmos and towards spiritual life. At the risk of seeming a little bit childish, pouch on the table, horn of plenty. We're all coming into this almond shape, uh, which ends the tarot. I argued that the, the Le Monde, the, the world, the universe, uh, at the end of the tarot is a kind of uh, a clit- clitoral shape, a shape of a clitoris. Perhaps I'll put it on, on the screen as well later. Uh, but you can see the almond shape, very typical in Renaissance art, when you're depicting uh, myth- mythical beings and deities. Uh, here's another example of the birth of creation. Not creation, but the birth of the womb, the almond shape of the pouch. We can see to the magician's left, to the passive side of the magician. So the horn of plenty, the cornucopia, is there, it's seemingly endless like Mary Poppins' bag. Although represented by a male figure, the magician is an androgynous individual working with light and shadow. So I guess the long blonde hair would point to him being uh, rather effeminate, possibly. Juggling from unconscious to the superconscious. I think we should spend a bit of time with that word superconscious. Uh, in the vocabulary of Rudolf Steiner, you've got the astral, so the plane of dreams and creation. Then you've got the super astral, which is the understanding of the astral, literally above the astral. Hodorowsky says instead the superconscious. Um, this is the possibly like a both an analytical and synthetic part of the, of human creation. In other words, a way of digesting teachings, uh, unweaving brands or, or strands, I should say, of ideas, and then synthesizing them. So very much uh, an interpretation of the world, a superconsciousness. He juggles the magician from superconscious to unconscious. He is holding an active wand in his left hand, while in his right he holds a a receptive pentacle. The pentacle being a coin, and then the wand on the left being a kind of uh, a stick or a staff or a, uh, a a wand, I guess. There's not much distinction in the tarot between a wand and a staff or a stick. So there's magic within the rod. Um, He is holding an active wand in his left hand, while in his right he holds a receptive pentacle. This yellow coin, a miniature sun, symbolizes perfection and truth, but it also tells us that the magician does not overlook the daily necessities. So the pentacle is associated with material life, with earning money, with having a roof over your head. So he's got both uh, the receptacle pentacle, home life, and the active wand, the sensual and magical life. Also suggests that there is magic in daily life as well. Right in the centre of it, right in his base, almost his womb area, just above the belly button, in the area of creation, or according to the Chinese, the area of energy, of qi. The blue wand in his other hand is seeking to capture the cosmic force. We can also see an extra flesh-coloured object there, like a sixth finger, that will find an echo in the second decimal series in the sixth toe of strength. This sixth sixth finger is perhaps an indication of his dexterity and skill at organising reality in conformance with his intelligence, but it remains a mystery. The magician could be a predestigitator, I can't pronounce that word, prestigitator, prestigitator, very hard, who is hiding something under the table or, to the contrary, an initiate. Keywords, shrewdness, initiation, beginning, need for aid, dexterity, that's a good one, dexterity, suppleness, youth, potential, 
Give something concrete, expression, disciple, malice, verve, talent, trickster. I would add wet. Uh, the boy, the adolescent, the freshness, the sap, as opposed to the dryness of old age. There's a sort of fluidity to the, to the magi- magician, to youth, to child, child, childhood. His table has three legs. Yeah, we can't see the fourth. It is conceivable that the fourth leg is located outside the card. It is by going beyond the stage of possibilities and moving into the reality of action and choice that the magician gives concrete expression to his situation. But we can also see that the three is the figure of the mind and light blue is the colour of spiritual receptivity. Similarly, the yellow shoes of the magician indicates that he touches the earth intelligently. An earth saturated with the red blood humanity while receiving the summons of divine strength. This is a spirit that seeks to situate itself within the human world and find solutions from, for material life. This card is therefore one that will evoke all the questions concerning employment, work and profession. A big lesson for me from meditation is that it is within the physical that we see transcendence. You don't need to go up to go beyond. In fact, it is within daily, ordinary physical experience and stimuli that there is magic embedded within. All that we have, all that we have in front of us on our table is already magic, is already uh, replete with uh, spirit. The small yellow tree beneath, between the magician's feet could be the sex organ of Mother Nature. Then we've got another almond shape right below the legs of the magician. The organ of Mother Nature which gave him birth. He comes down from another dimension in search of his world, his public, his field of activity, his art, his ideas, his loves, his desires. He is going to satisfy his needs, cheat, become initiated, begin to live. Uh, Particularly with Baptist or Pentecostal or Evangelical Christianity, the idea of being born again is absolutely essential. Has it occurred to those traditions that in order to be born again, you have to die? Your old self, self dies. The shell of previous you or the previous ego dies. So the magician seems to sort of be hovering above the candle flame of the birth, of his own birth of Mother Nature. How much does he need to reduce himself to forget himself to be reborn? How much do we need to die in order to be reborn again? We can see three dice on the table that inherently, that instantly uh, suggests uh, chance, possibility, maths, each of which shows three sides, one, two and four. Each die therefore gives us a value of seven. Again, we've got the numerological importance here for Hodorowsky and if we add all three dice together we get 21 which is the numerical value of the highest of the major arcana the world we can therefore say that the magician has the entire tarot at his disposal up to the total realization of the world similarly he has in his hands and on his table the four suits of the minor arcana a pentacle a wand a knife symbolizing swords and the cup for again earth wind water fire um this sort of uh, the, the uh, is it the tetragrammaton is that how i pronounced it the four animals that uh, the four disciples of of, G- of jesus or the the four gospels so i should say matthew mark luke and john security in four as well so he's surrounded by the four elements he's there is a real stability in the chaos that we see on the table. There's an, an amazing order. You can imagine connecting all of those four elements and it would look something like a star. Concealed among the objects of conjuring, we have all of these elements. The four suits of the minor arcana, so the pentacle, the wand, the swords, and the cup. This indicates to us that we attain the truth by crossing through illusion that the task of magic is to achieve the impossible. They have to go through the untrue, literally do something false, do something inherently impossible to go into a deeper uh, truth, to lift the veil of, um, of mystery. 
An orange shape reminiscent of a snake is at the level of his groin. In between the dice, he has placed the sexual force or Kundalini in front of him and he is capable of controlling it. So Kundalini is a Sanskrit word, I believe, uh, and a yogic practice. Kundalini is the source of energy from the perineum. So that's the space between the anus and the genitalia, the pelvic floor. The Kundalini is supposed to be a snake of energy that winds up into the body and actually has a physical winding, a spiral shape up through the body. That's suggested here in the tarot on the table where we have the uh, penis shapes uh, right in front of the, of the magician. He has placed a sexual force or Kundalini in front of him and he is capable of controlling it. The hat of the magician describes the beginning of a spiral. Again, the spiral of the Kundalini. So through the chakras, the zero or the first chakra is the perineum or the, the pelvic floor. And then the chakras are fascinating in, 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 the, in, the, in the text uh, that I've read that they're both um, immaterial places of energy so that they don't physically exist as we understand it. But they're definitely there. We've got the belly, we, we've got the, the chi, for example, we've got the prana, uh, we've got the, I'm forgetting the words, the throat chakra, heart chakra, head chakra, chakra above the head. And these are not sort of local, localized, centralized forces. So if you zoom in there, actually, you go around the chakra to explore them. And there's this idea of winding like a snake from the beginning of the Kundalini in the perineum right up to the top and beyond into the this, this uh, area here, and it's a dynamic action. It's never, you never stop in a chakra. It's always in motion. And then we have this like last chakra suggested by the hat. The hat of the magician describes the beginning of a spiral. He comes from the invisible insofar as he represents the first point. He emerges from the void to take his first steps in the world. On his hat, a spiritual umbilical cord yellow is emerging from his hair the mental realm and opening to merge anew with the sky in union with the universe the intense desire to achieve this union is symbolized by the red hump of his hat his purpose perhaps is to manage to immortalize individual consciousness there are small orange balls eight in his yellow locks that's interesting they're very defined the the balls within the hair there are small orange balls, eight, in his yellow locks, sim symbols of his enlightened intelligence, indicating that he is aware of perfection. Number eight is uh, for Khodorovsky, the number of perfection. Indicating that he is aware of perfection and has fixed it as his objective. On the psychological plane, he could also be seen as a young man who still has his head full of his mother's ideas. The eight represents justice, which is a female figure in the tarot, a, a maternal figure. The magician's belt is double. If we consider it as a symbol of the will, we can deduce from it that he is capable of exerting his will over his intellect, the upper part, but also above his animal nature, a union of the, the animal and the in intellectual. I've always really, I've always felt that music was a perfect blend of the animal and the intellectual. And if music was a chakra, it would be in the heart, or somewhere between the belly and the heart, unifying the head and the genitalia. I'll repeat this bit. Uh, the magician's belt is double. If we consider it as a symbol of the will, we can deduce from it that he is capable of exerting his will over his intellect, the upper part, but also over his animal nature, his flesh. From another perspective, this duality indicates that he has not yet fulfilled the realisation of his being. Yes, there's nothing finished in this card. There's nothing resolved. It's purposely... Uh, open-ended there's nothing bound or um, knotted up as long as one is subjugated by one's inner dialogue illumination and truth will not be there so again uh, the idea of of 
flow of absorption in the action the potential is always in movement just like those chakra we mentioned as long as one is subjugated by one's inner dialogue illumination and truth will not be there um, th there seems to be something beautiful about the lack of uh, realization in this card that it's okay to not be finished God only knows I don't start these videos with a clear plan at all, having drunk way too much coffee. Yeah, there seems to be something beautiful in emergence. Perhaps also there's an awareness that there is something unfinished there. The magician seems to be quite content that his um, table is in such chaos. There is a bit of a cliche, but there is an order. There is an order in the chaos. There's a union, a calmness residing in the eternal spiraling movement of number one, the magician. And I'll say it again, it's this number one that the rest of the tarot seems to lean on for energy. There needs to be a constant return to the origin to feed, to energize the rest of the tarot. I'm very curious about the, the look in the magician's eyes, though. I think at this point it is worth um, uh, pointing out the differences of the magician compared to other uh, tarot decks. The two, I would say, most famous ones, the Rider Waite Smith here, and I'll try and put it on the, the screen, as well as um, uh, Alistair Crowley's uh, uh, t um, tarot as well. Um, now I'll try and put both of them on the screen now. Um, and in both depictions of number one, the magician, we have absolute uprightness, strength, power. And I think this is a result of the enormous fetishization within both of these, uh, uh, the Rider Waite Smith and the Crowley decks, a big fetishization of spells and glitter and magic. I say this at this point, I don't want to insult anyone who really likes these decks. Um, there's a big conflict, I think, with, with uh, people who are really into the Renaissance decks, the Marseille decks, and the late 19th century, early 20th century decks. So I, I try and say this with love and respect, but they're not, my, they're not for me a very interesting uh, uh, aid to understanding the tarot or to, to understanding how you feel about the tarot. But they don't resonate with me because I feel there's no weakness in uh, that is celebrated in the Crowley or the Rider Waite Smith decks. I can't stand the stick like uprightness of the magician with this infinity symbol above his head, of this empire of glitter and smoke and false, shallow mystery. There is something lacking in these decks. Perhaps there isn't much chaos. There isn't much embracing of dirt, of exploration, of play. There's too much empire. There's too much commanding. These to me, despite um, being, um, being, being, uh, how do you say, executed or realized by a woman, the Rider Waite Smith deck to me is a very masculine understanding of magic, a commanding understanding, a, a, a dominion of mystery that to me, uh, has nothing to do with the humility and the self-abnegation, the ego erasure that we see, I feel, I read in the Marseille deck. I'll continue reading. And this is the part of uh, Hodorowski's chapter, which he calls in a reading. So when you sit down with, um, with your reader, with your mirror, with someone who reads the deck with you, what happens next? Now, at this point, uh, I will point out, most people are extremely happy to receive the magician. <laughs> yes, it's not death, great, but um, perhaps we could talk about the dangers of pure potential of this source of energy for the rest of the tarot, the rest of the arcana. The magician, I read, indicates a beginning. Reasoning is quick. There is no lack of astuteness and talent. All that remains is to take action. 
This card also indicates the necessity of choosing, deciding and going into mourning for the everything is possible. That is the mark of youth. In the family or the psychological world, this is the boy. The boy one still is even after 40 years have passed. The boy one should have been if not the boy one should have been if not born a woman. The boy that one has raised and the boy that one has trouble letting fly on his own wings. The boy one meets and with whom one is preparing to form a couple in which everything is to be invented. The magician shows that something is possible, that a new beginning can be made and that nothing is opposed to initiating a new action. His wand could represent a request for help or an inspiration waiting to be charged by a more mature force, or perhaps by the progress of maturity itself. That's really interesting. Where is, where is the latent maturity in the magician? If the magician represents a child or the youth, what is maturity? What is change? Can, can youth really exist if there is inherent within, literally within our DNA, the process of aging? Even though he is the first of the major arcana and an initiate in his own right, the magician still has a road to travel ahead of him. This is the card of the unity that must choose a way to take action. Really cheesy idea, cliched idea of spiritual growth, but where is your inner child? Who is the inner little curious boy? I say boy because that's what Hodorowsky says in this card. It's not much mention of this, but where's the play? Where, when does Hodorowsky mention the word play? Exploration, learning through play. We come to the point where the magician opens his mouth and the, the uh, subheading, and if the magician spoke. I quote the magician, here we go. I am in the present. Whatever action I wish to undertake, it is now time to commit. My entire future is seeded in the decisions I make at this moment. If you think about it, the future is already realized in a way. It's already there. It's planted in the potential of number one. Do as I do. See all the moments when you are not yourself, where you are not living in the here and now. That is the moment of eternity and the sight of the infinite. I'm going to read that again. Do as I do. See all the moments when you are not yourself, where you are not living in the here and now. That is the moment of eternity and the sight of the infinite. So beckoning, the, the magician is uh, signaling to the, to the person being read to, Think about all the times you're being distracted from your being, from your essence. What are you waiting for? Drop those useless burdens that are the remainders of the past and fear of the future. I embody the energy called consciousness. That would imply that being truly present also means being conscious of the influence of the future, of what the potential you have for the future and being reunited with the future. I embody the energy called consciousness. That's with a capital C, signaling again that Steiner mode, Rudolf Steiner zone of the super astral. It's kind of like imagining if the present was a pebble, the super astral was kind of an octopus with all of its tentacles surrounding on understanding the, the moment. Another uh, image of that could be super astral. I hope I'm making some kind of sense. Consciousness with a capital C, the super astral, total awareness uh, is a bit like if the present is a piece of candy, I'm going to say, then the super astral consciousness is the wrapper around it, the candy wrapper, which unites the future and the past in one flowing unity, just like the hat of the magician. Being absolutely present in the sweetness in the moment. That's copyright Pascal Ansel right there. Don't steal that from me. The sweet rapper is the conscious, the super astral, the, the consciousness. Can you tell I'm proud of that? I'm proud of that. 
Sweetly, we move on. Let's keep moving on. I am not separate from my surroundings. That's true. He looks really blent in with the table, uh, with the the dry ground, with the vaginal uh, lick of flame of the maternal presence right at the bottom b between his feet. There is a lot of white in the tarot. It's easy to forget this. It's a lot of empty space. This card would be really too busy if there was anything going on really in the background. But it is, is worth paying attention a little bit to the colourlessness, the whiteness behind him. I am not separate from my surroundings. I am aware of the breathtaking multiplicity of everything that is. I invite you to experience this inventory with me. Inventory, series of tools, his, his toys around him. Be aware of all the spaces of all matter, trees, planets, galaxies, atoms, cells. The table, his, his toys, toys or his tools, do look like a bit of a, a galaxy in themselves. If I am aware, I am not merely a limited mind inside a given form. I become the totality, capital T, of the divine work. How does one become conscious? It is simple. You do not have any past within, nor any future. Nothing but one moment. The candy wrapper, the top of uh, the magician's head, the flow of the past and the future in one beautiful moment. Not of the present, but of all three modes of time coming together. You do not have any past within, nor any future to become conscious. Nothing but one moment. Nothing. You are nothing. You are impossible. The cosmic moments you should break once and for all with the deviations of the ego, the old wounds, the old wounds. So trauma, the word trauma, the Greek word meaning, uh, meaning wound, assault, and the, the Latin for trauma, punctum, being pierced. Forget your old wounds. You must attach yourself from all plans, all suffering, all programming. In other words, Go out and meditate. Go and sit quietly in your room, as Blaise Pascal suggested. Only then will the light of consciousness arrive. If you are living for yourself in the moment, death does not exist. You have suffered losses in the past and you may suffer more in the future, but here and now, nothing is lost. Perhaps you aspire to perfect yourself, to improve your life, but at the moment, there are no aspirations. You are there with all your potential. Towards this part of the, towards the end of uh, Hodorowski's chapters, at the end of his explanations or his interpretations of the major arcana, we have a little subheading among the traditional interpretations. This one is full of words. I probably won't ring all of them, read all of them. We've got beginning, is one of them. Con man, that's interesting. We haven't. I, I've given a lot of good, good publicity for the magician, but yeah, of course there were con men. There were dark artists. Uh, there were tricksters, there were charlatans and vagabonds and so on. Uh, how, how can we be misled by our idea of ourselves as magicians? How could we uh, enter the, the, the dangerous sphere of hubris, of undue pride? Another of the uh, traditional interpretations, player. Beneath the table, what a great thing to think about. What's beneath the table? What is he hiding? Consciously or not. New enterprise, new studies, professional renewal, beginning of a relationship, debutant or debutante, so someone entering society, entering a new uh, workplace perhaps, or social circle, shrewdness, I like that one, you know, suppleness, flow, dexterity, art of persuasion, multiple talents. Um, the next one's quite interesting, to wish, to dare, to be able to obey. That really is in the realm of the, the uh, later forms of the tarot, the Crowley and the Rider Waite Smith. Hesitation, that's an interesting one. The boy, the magician, doesn't look so sure of what he's looking towards. Multiple potentials. Beginning of the quest for wisdom. And that signals a part of the Bible I'll read in a, a second about being a child and entering heaven uh, by, by being a child. A kind of humility required to progress spiritually. Spiritualization of matter. So the last paragraph. 
I, the magician, take a position in the crossroads of eternity and infin infinity that we call the present. I am loyal to everything that I am, my body, my intelligence, my heart, my creative force. My table of flesh has its three feet rooted in the ground. I anchor myself somewhere in the diversity, and it is from this point that I take action. Out of the infinite number of possibilities, I have chosen one, my golden pentacle, the traction point that will lead me to totality. real uh, moment a real sweet place to pause for thought is where is the fourth leg where is the fourth leg of this table what is it doing <laughs> it seems like an impossible question but it seems to me always we're heading towards impossibility in this card um, Valentin Tomberg in his Meditations on the Tarot discusses in his chapter on the magician of the tightrope walker which ha who has to eliminate all activity of the intellect and of the imagination. You also can think of a boxer, uh, a rock climber, someone who has to remain in the present just to uh, uh, survive, to keep doing the job. So we can, as I said, spend a bit more time talking about the negative aspects of the magician. The magician as a medieval bullshit artist. It's a great bit of British English there. A bullshit artist. A charlatan. A, a street vendor hollering. Who is the magician helping? Is the magician helping someone else? Is the magician helping himself? Is the magician helping someone else to help himself? The impossible... Uh, dilemma, I would say, of, of a Baptist or, or, or of an evangelical Christian is you help others to eventually get your ticket to heaven. So inherently, there's a selfish attitude to charity. You should help someone because that's good in itself, not because it will get you a ticket to anywhere. So who is the magician helping? Where's the magician? Where is the energy of the magic projected to himself? Is it actually good sometimes just to help ourselves? Are the potions he makes, uh, are they for the sick? Or are they drugs for himself? Is he creating fireworks to please himself? Is he, like me, an isolated bedroom performer, broadcaster, spiralling into his own gyrating, almost masturbatory narcissism? Where are you in relation to your laboratory into your own play i think we could do a whole series on masturbation uh what is it to play with oneself how much is it required how much is, is it good how much is it healthy how much is it uh, dangerous i read uh some time ago i had no idea about this but catholic monks are not always discouraged from masturbation it's actually in certain um, brotherhoods it's encouraged which to me makes perfect sense uh, given the history of the Catholic Church but I just thought they would be so uh, repressed that they wouldn't have any time to contemplate uh, self-help <laughs> um, but how much is there self-love within the magician's uh, self-serving exploration exploration of the tools exploration of his own self as his own uh, phallic uh, uh, toys there's a lot to say for masturbation, I would say. There's a lot to say for also coming to the sensual part of the wands, the sticks. Um, baguette, the word baguette actually just means stick. So chopsticks in French are baguette, not just the bread. Uh, wand is a baguette as well. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, we've got le batteleur. I think batteleur, the French word for magician here, is the stick person. I might, I might have got that wrong, but I think that's, that's, that's where it is. Um, according to Helen Farley, who wrote A Cultural History of the Tarot, and I'll quote here, in these early decks, so in the pre-Marseille uh, decks, so this is in the Visconti Sforza decks of Renaissance Italy, in the early decks, the magician was a juggler, an entertainer, or a stage, ma stage magician. Um, in later decks, the figure was more explicitly a conjurer. 
So there's more explicit magic going on and less play. But there's still inherently play in the, um, the first uh, versions of the tarot, in the, of the European tarot. In later decks, the figure was more explicitly a conjurer. Yet in the Visconti's fourth deck, his role was more ambiguous and he could have been a merchant or an artisan. The low status of the card, so we are right at the bottom of the pile, really. There is a strong sense of ascendance and priority and um, numerical importance in the, in the tarot. The low status of the card was reinforced by Il Bagatella's red garb, which distinguished, distinguished him from all other figures in the deck. Red was only deemed appropriate for disreputable members of society, such as foot soldiers, executioners, gamblers and dandies, no doubt and butchers as well. An indictment on the card that immediately followed it. So this was always a low status card, something which our friends Alistair Crowley and Rider Waite Smith have entirely forgotten in their empire of magic, as we see the proud male dominating over the mysterious world. Yuck. The Popes, Emperor, Empress, and Pope, those are the cards that follow. One, two, uh, two three, four. The Popes, Emperor, Empress, and Pope. The inference would have been that these figures were only marginally better than a common conjurer, a view not difficult to understand given the uneasy relationship the Viscontis shared with both the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire. It's a busy day for the police of Arles, clearly. I keep the window open just to bring a bit of ordinary sound into the readings. Um... I'm going to just go through, through a few notes that I've made over the years, actually, that I've spent with this card. Hodorowski suggests walking around with the cards, putting them in your breast pocket or in your pocket, putting them in your bag, traveling around with them, which is what I've done. I think there is a big selfishness in this card, a big um, magnification of the ego, uh, of, the, of the I. Uh, and again, where, where are those potions? Where are those what's the magic heading towards that to me is this, this like fourth leg part of this card where who is he serving who are we serving when we engage in mysticism and in alchemy and in magic what are the differences i ask myself uh, between this quest this alchemical quest for the philosopher's stone and the quest for opium if we're just looking for the the golden particle the, uh, the Holy Grail, are we just looking for this boiled down truth, this escape from wandering, this dream world of opium? Secondly, if this is the magician, what do we mean by magic? What is magic? Um, well, I, I think I sometimes use that word when I don't know what I'm talking about. When I want to talk about something maybe quite beautiful and mysterious that is beyond the a uh, realm of language. Is it okay to not be able to express in words certain things? Yes, in my opinion. Um, when am I using this word in a, a, a heartful way? Uh, when I'm talking about mystery. Magic is a word that sort of accelerates meaning but before it seems to cast uh, gold dust on prior uh, meaning for good and bad could be a kind of verbal charlatanism that I'm using when I use the word magic. But I do think so many aspects of human behaviour, like confidence, like the whole realm of confidence is a kind of magic. To me, it has no origin. Excuse me. Or it has no one concentrated uh, origin that we can locate, at least. It might have an origin, but it's impossible to locate. It is a constantly moving source of energy just like the chakras. The chakras are always moving, they're always dynamic, they're always spiralling around a certain unlocatable uh, centre, which does come towards a scientific principle that, um, I hope I'm not misquoting it, Heisenberg's principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The, 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 this is an observable fact, if I'm not completely mis mistaken, you can't find the centre of anything, you can't locate an atom in... Um, uh, 
definitively because it's always moving atoms are always moving particles are always in flux heisenberg's uncertainty principle is the magical element within modern physics so if we can't locate the center of creation we can't locate the center of of confidence and um, so many elements of our of our behavior and of our healing if it's unlocatable how much can we relax or retire from the idea of pinpointing of looking for the holy grail of looking for the origin of something how much is it wise to be naive how much can we retreat from desiring to know everything that's the table the table <laughs> the fourth leg of the table that's the tale or the fable i should say tale plus fable equals table that's the fable of Goethe's Faust, of course, or Thomas Mann's Faust, the uh, selling your soul for knowledge, getting by undue means your, uh, your enlightenment. In other words, it could be a metaphor for drugs as well, drugs being an acceleration of the natural processes of, of brain chemistry. So if remaining naive seems to be a key principle to spiritual development we come back to the archetype of the child something that was very very key i i, I would say to the teaching of jesus in and i'm going to look down on my ipad now mark 10 verses chapter uh, verses uh, 13 to 16 i'll quote a famous passage about being a child to to inherit the world of God or to enter God's kingdom. And they were bringing children to him, to Jesus, so that he might touch them. So Jesus would, would heal, heal these, these sick children. Uh, but the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, when Jesus saw that his disciples were uh, telling off the adults, bringing their children for Jesus to heal them, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Jesus doesn't say uh, whoever is not an adolescent, whoever is not an adult. He actually says, pinpoints a child. And a child is number one, is the primary force. An adolescent, number two, three, four, whatever. Adult towards the end of the deck. A child. What is childhood? What is innocence? How can you redefine the word innocence? We all know children are immensely capable of understanding mystery and of being absorbed in play. They are the ones who haven't learned the bad habits. But how is innocence a radical knowingness, radical knowledge, not an ignorance? So we're not being adolescents aping adults. Children often don't want to ape anyone they don't want to pretend to be anyone they're happy where they are often nor are we actually becoming adults with the clothes of a child we're really becoming child children again rebirth or death of the old self so to be truly a child in my opinion is to be primary to be primal uh, and that means a, to be involved in play where there is no reason for the play there is no uh, ulterior motive to playing. There's simply joy in, as Hodorowsky says, in the moment, in the now. To spend more time with yourself, possibly to engage in masturbation, spiritually or otherwise. <laughs> I might regret saying that. The territory of dreams is the territory where you don't stop and ask why you're dreaming. That's something that Sam Harris says in a recent podcast on on dreaming, on sleep. I think I'm nearly, uh, nearly found the end, the end of the candy wrapper of this uh, of this reading. I'll just highlight drugs, particularly alcohol. Alcohol, if we have like a mixing desk and the faders of the mixing desk. To me, alcohol increases the fader of impulsiveness or impulsivity and of instinct. Children seem to be very, very impulsive and 
easily distractible. Um, dotting from side to side, like a tennis ball against two walls or a squash ball against a wall. That might be how it looks from the, from the, from the, from the external. Uh, but perhaps uh, children are very much guided by an inner intuition of knowledge seeking and play through thought. Alcohol, to me, mimics this, and not always in a bad way and not always in a good way. It just mimics impulsivity and it increases, as I said, the fader of instinct. You don't pause to stop and think. That's why so many people regret what they do when they are drunk. Um, impulsive is a really interesting word etymologically. It comes from Proto-Indo-European word, or suffix, Pel. Pel, I should say it's a prefix, not a suffix. Pel uh, relates to the word anvil, uh, appeal, catapult. Three lovely words right there. Anvil, appeal, catapult, impulse, striking. So the past participle of impel is impulse, impulsive. It doesn't relate to pulsing, actually relates to striking, hitting, pel. So impulsive historically meant to push against, to strike on, something that is sudden. And something that is sudden, both when children are very impulsive, do something dangerous, do something wonderful, is both something good and bad or neither. It doesn't stop to think of itself as either good or bad, doesn't stop to think about the origin of things, it's just involved in the flow of knowingly, of knowing play. Playing knowingly or indulgence in the moment. Thanks for watching.